so this is the course outline so i would like to discuss this because i was not able to discuss this in the last class so uh deep learning what exactly is that right uh, we we must know the definition so it can be considered to be an advanced uh, type of uh, machine learning okay. it's basically machine learning but uh, it's an advanced type of machine learning and the uh, what distinguishes uh, deep learning from machine learning is that it can solve problems that cannot always be efficiently or effectively solved by traditional machine learning algorithms so there is a large class of problems which we also discussed in the last uh, brief class that we had um, that cannot be uh, dealt with machine learning so in order to solve those type of problems the basic model that we need to use is the artificial neural network okay and uh, we will see today why this uh, ann is the only uh, contribution from machine learning ke which we can use in deep learning because uh, we know that machine learning is also offering us uh, random forest and xg boost and the support vector machines and logistic regression but uh, we are still focusing only on artificial neural networks because they offer us something which is really powerful and uh, which cannot be computed by any other machine learning algorithm okay so therefore uh, ann is the only uh, solution that we take forward uh, in the deep learning arena so some examples that we include are this uh, image generation um so that's that's a very very complicated example of deep learning that you start to generate your own images uh, any type of images that you want not necessarily human faces because that's just a game right generation of human faces that's not even allowed legally uh, you generate faces which have never existed before uh but uh, you you might need to generate some other sort of images like for example scenery images or some uh images of some paint uh, of some uh, painter very famous painter in the in the past years so you can take his images and generate some new images uh but i don't know what is the financial worth of such an activity okay so uh, it this could also have some implications in a military scenario Uh, because uh, in the military scenario if you tell uh, the system what is happening right now if you feed it the images it might be able to predict the next image it might be able to generate the next image any yani maybe some attack or maybe some you know something goes wrong or or there is some uh, there is some rocket attack or something like that so it is possible in a military scenario object detection that's a very famous uh, example that was even used in machine learning so hame ye baat samajh mein aani chahiye ki machine learning mein we were already using uh, artificial neural networks uh, for some type of tasks like uh, character recognition or you know uh, letter recognition digit recognition barcode recognition something like that uh so yeah so these type of things were already being used in machine learning in artificial neural networks and the algorithm that we use there is typically called the multi layer perceptron and that name is also not even good you know because that name is a biased name but okay we'll discuss about that later um but we would typically call it the mlp so i'm sure that uh at least half of you have already gone through that algorithm and maybe those who have taken ml1 i am sure ke they all of you have used the mlp but you probably don't have a very good idea what happens inside it uh but you know about it right so you can use the algorithm so what i want to tell you is that object detection uh, i don't know about object detection but some sort of very simple detection like uh, hand written recognition um or maybe just barcode recognition and you know that's called an obr um uh, that's called the obr ocr object character recognition obr object bar recognition uh, 
So these are very, very ancient technologies like 1950, 1995, 96 in those times. Uh, since those times, uh, we are using the uh, multi-layer perceptron to detect those, uh, detect these small things. So that is not deep learning, okay? Just keep this in mind. When I talk about object detection, that is something more complicated. Okay, so we, because in, in an image, I can have many objects and I want the system to detect all the objects with a certain probability. So that makes the thing more complicated. Uh, text generation, that is becoming very common these days. That's a common problem, text generation. I want to be able to generate the next sequence of text, whether it is bioinformatics text, uh, whether it is normal text, whether it is any type of uh, textual documents that you are uh, analyzing. I want to be able to summarize the text uh, like we discussed in the last class, face recognition, image captioning, that's also uh, a more of a classification problem, but that cannot be solved by multi-layer perceptrons. That's not, that's not in their power to do that. Uh, and uh, enhanced uh, time series forecasting models. Right, so uh, we discussed last time that time series forecasting is definitely, um, uh, it's, it's there since the last 50, 60 years. It's, it's nothing new, but uh, now we have some techniques from deep learning which are able to perform in a better way on most of the data sets. I will not say that they always succeed, but uh, it has been seen that the performance of time series forecasting is better on deep learning models than on the traditional models. So, uh, so that's why we must also go through that, inshallah. The purpose is to help you develop a good understanding of the mathematics uh, behind the maths uh, mathematics behind the artificial neural networks, uh, which primarily includes the back propagation algorithm and the feed uh, feed forward mechanism. So you just have to understand some vector notation, and then you have to understand how the back propagation works. Uh, you must distinguish between the shallow, that is the multi-layer perceptron, and deep neural networks. Uh, obviously, you must uh, understand the theoretical and you must get the hands-on knowledge of uh, convolution neural networks, which are primarily used for image processing or image-based tasks uh, to a large extent. Uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, which are primarily used for sequence forecasting, and also obviously time series forecasting is inclusive uh, to a large extent and generative models which are used to generate any type of data, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, company data, they are KPIs data, they are forecasting data, uh, images, videos, whatever. I mean, typically we are focusing more on images. So more work on deep learning has been done in the domain of convolution neural networks in the last, uh, uh, 20, uh, in the last 10 or 11 years, most of the work done has been on CNNs. But since the last uh, six years or eight, seven years, recurrent neural networks have really been, uh, you know, they have really shown a lot of, uh, um, how to say, the superior performance uh, in many tasks. So they must be taken seriously. And we have several concepts in these that we will need to study. And in the generative models, I told you last time that we have the um, restricted Boltzmann machine, we have the autoencoder, and we also have the generative adversarial network. So we need to go through, through these three. Uh, restricted Boltzmann machine is a type of uh, uh, deep belief network. So we basically have to study deep belief networks to understand the RBMs. So if you, if you are able to understand the maths of a basic neural network, then you will be able to understand the maths of all the other algorithms. Otherwise, you cannot proceed. Sorry? CNN or RNN uh, look, uh, the difference between CNN and RNN is regarding their architecture, right? Uh, convolution neural network includes two specific type of layers, uh, which are not included in any other type of uh, deep learning network. Like, maybe, uh, for example, the convolution layer 
and the wax cooling layer. So these layers are are uh, these layers are actually uh, used to extract the relevant features from an image. Um, what are the relevant features of an image that can help me do image captioning or image uh, object detection or whatever, or maybe even image generation? But the purpose, uh, the main purpose of convolutional neural networks is to work with images to uh, actually uh, select those features which are most important for me because uh, typically an image contains thousands of features. Each pixel is a feature. So I do not want to use every feature. Otherwise, my back propagation algorithm is going to take a lot of time to train the algorithm. So that is the reason I use a CNN to basically filter out all the irrelevant features and select only the best ones. So it is not a hand guided procedure, but uh, it works in most situations. So the people use it. And most of the uh, research done in convolutional neural uh, has been done in convolutional neural network. So uh, we have the ImageNet competition, uh, which is held, uh, which was held each year before COVID. And the ImageNet competition has given rise to has created basically five or six very, very cool uh, convolutional neural networks. For example, uh, we have the uh, VGG net, we have the REST net, uh, we have Alex net. So these are three very famous examples. So these are the winners of the image net competition. So now the accuracy of uh, this uh, object detection and all these things is, is very close to 100%. Uh, because ResNet is, I think, one of the best uh, CNNs right now, but it is very computationally expensive. It is it, had, it contains millions of hyperparameters. But so we don't we, we don't want to use that in this course. We can only use that for a very complicated task uh, in the in some big company if it is required. Uh, but otherwise, we don't even need to use that there. So I hope this is clear. Uh, recurrent neural networks are basically doing recurrence. So recurrence, what does that mean? That uh, occurring again and again. Okay, so what happens in recurrent neural networks is that we are actually, um, we are actually uh, saving uh, the history because recurrent neural networks have nothing to do with images. They work mostly with sequential data. And uh, I, can, I, can input, I can input sequential data of images uh, for example, if I have images in a sequence in a video, I can input that. But primarily, uh, they are being used for textual data or time series data, for example, in which I have a sequence with respect to time, for example. Uh, for example, if you see any text, then one word comes after the other. So there is a sequence. So wherever there is a sequence, then you can use the current neural networks to predict the next sequence. Uh, so uh, they are actually better than the traditional uh, time series forecasting models because they're able to store a lot of history uh, of the past in making prediction of the future. Uh, so for example, ARIMA and all these algorithms, they are not storing that much history, right? Uh, but in our case, uh, the recurrent neural networks, we are able to store uh, history of the sequence to make predictions better. Another difference is that in the recurrent neural networks, we have feedback loops, which we don't have in CNNs, but I'll discuss them later. Uh, and then you have to teach the students the architecture of a deep learning project. So obviously uh, we have to see how we will implement the project, uh, train the students in the expected behavior of each deep learning algorithm. So we'll have to be trained on that because um it's it's one thing to study in in an academic environment but when you do the hands on then the things get really uh, different because uh, black deep learning is like a black box you absolutely have no idea what's happening inside you can just configure the layers and you can just configure the hyperparameters and just uh, follow the basic guidelines and see what happens so you have to get comfortable with that. There is no other solution. There is no standardization with respect to that. We, no one can standardize it. You just have to see an experiment for yourself. So that's why you have to do extensive hands-on as well. So these are the takeaways, pretty much what we have studied above. 
So you will understand the theories of these things and uh, you will do the hands-on with the CNNs, uh, LSTM, which is a type of recurrent neural network, autoencoder and GANs. Um, so this is something which we will do towards the end of the course if uh, time remains, but I, I think I can, I, can, I can just punch it in. Um, it's very similar to machine learning and deep learning. So there's nothing, not a problem about that. Um, practical examples to better understand the mathematical concepts. Uh, yeah, so that's important. Hands-on is the, are these, uh, obviously, uh, TensorFlow plus Keras, PyTorch, Cafes. You can use any of these three. And Jupyter Lab is obviously what you're going to be working with. Uh, yeah, so lecture breakdown, you just have to go through this uh, brief introduction to DL potential student project. We did that. Differences from machine learning, we did that. Evolution of machine learning and deep learning. You already know about this. I'll just tell you about it a bit more today importance of artificial neural networks. So I just forgot to include the slide for this. I will just tell you today. Um, and then obviously we have to go very deep into shallow neural networks, single layer, multi-layer, perceptron rule, gradient descent, back propagation, loss functions, hyperparameter tuning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we have to discuss uh, regularization, optimization algorithms, batch normalization, which is very important for deep learning. Uh, some practical aspects, how to tune the model, deep learning, pipeline, and strategy. Uh, then we will work with the convolution neural networks in detail. I have put that, uh, I think, oh, there's a mistake here, so we can correct it later on. Uh, convolution neural networks, uh, so edge detection, padding, convolution operators, CNN architecture, parameter sharing, object localization detection, LeNet, LXNet, VGG, ResNet, Inception Net, et cetera. So we'll, we'll discuss all these famous convolution neural networks, but we will, be not, we will not be doing hands-on on, on these uh, because they are pretty complicated and uh, they require lots of uh, hyperparameters. So we might not have the time for that. So we will just experiment with the basic Manila one. So in the case of recurrent neural networks, we'll do all these things, inshallah, sequence modeling, building the RNN, back propagation through time. LSTM, uh, attention networks basically means that uh, because I told you that the recurrent neural networks are focusing on the history of the sequence, right? I told you that. So everything in the history is not important, right? I just need to look at a few important things to make a prediction about the future. So that's where uh, attention comes in. So attention helps me focus on specific areas of the sequence, uh, which can save my time a lot, uh, and you know save my hyperparameter tuning time a lot. Okay. So it has applications in NLP, word embedding, et cetera, et cetera. Then we will do generative models uh, for two to three weeks, uh, and then we have some miscellaneous topics as well. Because the problem is that uh, what happens is that, uh, for example, um, let's say I use an autoencoder. See, the autoencoder has two portions. So one is the encoder portion, so it encodes the input. And the other is the decoder portion, which reproduces the same input as the output, OK? So uh, typically, I use the MLP format here, uh, the typical neural network. Uh, I can use it here in the encoder and decoder, but now that uh, the, the, the uh, deep learning major research trend right, for in the last several years is that we are using hybrid models. So in the encoder, I can input, for example, here uh, an LSTM. Okay. For, for some reason, I input the LSTM. For some reason, I input the LSTM here as well. There are other encoders in which uh, these guys will say, okay, okay I, I want to use a CNN here, and I want to use a CNN here. So these kind of hybrid models are the topic of miscellaneous. And you know people are just trying to find avenues of doing research in deep learning. Uh, there might be, you know, uh, they just, it's a, it's, a, it's a big black box, which is doing amazing things. So people are just trying out different things and uh, to, to determine, 
अच्छा यार किस तरह परफॉर्मेंस बेहतर हो सकती है अच्छा यार दिस कैन ऑल्सो बी डन दिस कैन ऑल्सो बी डन दिस कैन ऑल्सो बी डन सो दैट्स वेयर द रिसर्च इज गोइंग ऑन सो वी हैव टू और थ्री थिंग्स हेयर कैप्सूल नेटवर्क विच वी कैन कवर वेरी ब्रीफली कॉन्वल्यूशनल एल एस टी एम दैट्स वन एग्जाम्पल इन विच अ कॉन्वल्यूशन न्यूरल नेटवर्क इज मर्ज विद एन एल एस टी एम वन शॉर्ट लर्निंग सायमीज नेटवर्क ट्रिपलेट लॉस ग्राफ सी एन एन uh this is not very important because this can get very complicated if time remains and we will we'll do that and then we will have the project presentations and exams uh okay uh so we have two books here which are the standard books of deep learning uh one is this one by ian uh, goodfellow uh and the other is this one which is uh, written by uh, i forgot the name of this person i think it's him or something like that uh so this explains neural networks in a good way and will be following this very closely uh besides that we have uh, deep learning with python i have already uploaded that introduction to machine learning obviously uh, to clear your remain to, to 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 make sure that your concepts of machine learning are okay so you have to uh, must have this book by reference book and also the book uh, by murphy which is also yeah so uh, so there are many many recommended courses that you can take online if you want to uh, in parallel with this course we have the oxford one stanford one uh, then we have you know this uh, so we have several courses of stanford then the oxford one uh, this is an also curated list of courses you can link you can search these up and then obviously we always have this machine learning mastery which is going to guide you inshallah a lot in different areas of uh, hands on especially because you know uh, i am teaching deep learning but uh, i don't live inside a deep learning engine right <laughs> it's a it's basically a black box to everyone so people who have developed expertise in machine learning is through extensive hands on okay so that's why we have to listen to people like jason brownley and other people who have who have done extensive hands on so there are many people who have done that and they are now masters of deep learning so they can tune a model in a jiffy and they know the ins and outs of how to ensure that things are working in a good way um as far as grade is concerned so um so i i thought 10% for quizzes uh 20% for assignments and 10% each for each of the hourlies and 45% for the project so this is the current division uh and i can change that if there is some relative uh you know some trend in your grades which forces me to change the weightage so i can do that um because i am i am frankly more interested in the i can decrease the weightage of the hourlies because um, i i just want to test a few mathematical concepts so i don't need to i don't need three hourlies for that uh ha huh, so unless i want to test them over different algorithms so maybe i will need three hourlies so i'll just maybe reduce that to 5% maybe so this can be going 0.05 and i can increase the weightage of the project uh, or the assignments okay so i will be a little lenient in giving assignments or i right now i have to be because i am not feeling that well uh but I, as compared to machine learning one so this i will be lenient so any questions up to now ji uh So, Doctor Tariq, yeah. will there 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 won't be any final exam or early three is final exam? Yeah, as far as my knowledge is concerned, we are there were no hourlies which were uh, there were no final exam announced. We are going to have three hourlies. I don't understand the I don't understand the purpose of a final exam after taking three hourlies. I think the third hourly is the final exam. Oh, okay. Uh, by the way, the total is not ending up being one. I think. Acha. Five. Oh yeah, you're right. So. So maybe I'll just uh, do one of them as point oh five. Sorry about that. I will just uh, I might reduce the weightage of one of the hourlies, okay? Okay. Uh, doctor, I will just uh, yeah. 
इसके अलावा असाइनमेंट्स किस टाइप के हो सकते हैं हाँ लुक दी असाइनमेंट्स कैन बी मैथमेटिकल इन नेचर एज वेल एंड दी असाइनमेंट्स कैन बी प्रोग्राम प्रोग्रामेटिक असाइनमेंट्स प्रोग्रामिंग असाइनमेंट्स because i uh, i want the, the the point is that you have to develop your skills on on two things uh, first is the maths and that is not very complicated and the other thing are the programming which which is your own i, I think you guys should be motivated on your own to work if you are motivated yourself then you will work yourself you don't even need you know okay so you are you need me to give the uh, give you the assignment but you know you can you can do much more than about by give you so in deep learning if you want to learn deep learning then you have to experiment quite a lot and experimentation is very very easy because the code has the code is there the apis are there you don't have to write much code unless you want to develop some api yourself for your own benefit in machine learning yes we need to do uh a a a script because we need to do data wrangling we need to do eda which is a very very complicated activity and we need to do feature selection but in deep learning the feature selection is done by the algorithm itself you know we just need to ensure the basic cleaning and okay for deep learning the um uh deep learning ke liye jo data wrangling hoti hai na that is primarily image processing because i told you ke uh, the people who are working in deep learning uh they have primarily work with image data so for the image data the data wrangling part is image processing like uh, you clean the noise in the image you uh, you detect the edges in the image you segment the image etc etc you have lots and lots of image, image processing operators okay so for example you can compute some histograms over the image to you can summarize the image you can cluster the image all of these are image processing application so i i don't think so that will be the main scope of the course but uh, i will give you inshallah the list of uh, image processing applications that might be useful for you because if you if like it's it's very similar to machine learning like if you take a raw data and put it put give it to svm svm is probably going to give you an error similarly if you take a raw image and immediately give it to a cnn you might not get what you want so the image has to be processed the image has to be uh, the image has to be processed in a good way before it can be given to a convolutional neural network do you understand this point ha uh, is this thing clear yes sir ah uh, so yes, uh, so this is important so we will so if the image processing api is also there in python so you can use that so you just have to you know join the blocks together so programming assignments are not a problem is that not a problem you need to do them more and more so that you can learn the skill of what happens to a cnn how do i tune a cnn how do i tune uh, an lstm so that i can get out of it what i want you cannot jump inside it you know you have no control over it you just have to tune the hyper parameters and that's the game that you have to learn through extensive hands on otherwise you know you you can't apply that in the industry the industry will not be asking you for the algorithms of back propagation that's for your own knowledge of what happens inside that's to distinguish you from a data analyst right uh, but uh, you should you should be able to tune the algorithm in a good way for that you have to do hands on okay uh just just give me just give me 2 minutes i'll be back okay so uh we have we have discussed the uh the course outline we have also talked about the requirement for laptops and uh, the uh availability of google colab for doing the assignments but for the project we need might need something more concrete paral uh um, so in this uh, foundation this is also a foundation lecture we are going to have some exercises which we are going to solve during the class so please pay attention uh, i am all i am uh, because we i am supposed to mark the attendance so 
uh, I am noticing the attendance with respect to class participation. In an online scenario, uh, it's not possible to mark the attendance uh, very efficiently, uh, but uh, it's more important for you guys to contribute uh, to, the, to the lecture, okay? Okay, so we are starting right from the beginning so that you know we don't miss out on anything. So just consider something like this. I have this uh, number written here, uh, 5,4192. And I was able to read this number very uh, easily because um, I recognize everything here, right? I recognize the 504192. I also recognize the 100 and the 100 and the 100,000 and num the place of the number. So I, I, I tell you, okay, this, this means basically 500,000, uh, five, uh, five, 500,000, 4,000 and 192, okay? So I'm able to do that very quickly because what happens is that uh, our brain has two hemispheres, left and right one. So we have an area which is called a primary visual cortex, uh, which is in fact V1. This is V1 here. Uh, this contains 140 million neurons. Okay, so that's uh, that's from God, obviously. Uh, so 140 million neurons. What's a neuron? A neuron is a processing unit. It's like a very small computer, and its purpose is to its purpose is to either charge and fire or just remain silent or die for example you can say uh, so either it is silent or sleeping or or it is charged or fired that's it that's that's what a neuron is doing uh, why do we need 140 million neurons uh, i don't have the answer to that um, it just basically shows you that the more processing power you have the more you can do so that's why humans are able to do much much more uh, by using uh, your brain uh, than any other machine, so we are we are we are we are uh, talk, we are seeing talks of uh, you know robots uh, computing with man with respect to intelligence, but you know it's 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 one thing to replicate the neural network of the human mind, but uh, it's another thing to to make it function like God does. Okay, so that's what you need to keep in mind. Okay. Replication is not going to give you the same performance because God has his own way of doing things. Uh, so we are using the neurons. There's no doubt about that, but how the thought is being created that something comes from God. So you can try to replicate, you can try to make a neural net, artificial neural network as intelligent as possible. So maybe it will be able to generate some thoughts, but it will not be like a human mind. Okay, because you can't replicate uh, what God has made, you know, you can't replicate that exactly. It's very difficult. So in any case, we have uh, made a copy of the process <laughs> and we have been very successful in doing many uh, applications of images and text. So it's working very good for us and we're happy with that, okay? So it's a, it's a very huge neural network, biological neural network, tens of billions of connections between them. So you can't, you can't imagine what's there, right? Uh, and yet, it's it's not just the V1 part here, but it's actually a series of visual cortices, like V2, V3, V4, V5, and you know I don't know V6, and up to you can take up to V100 probably. But I think it finishes up to V5, doing progressively more complex image processing. Do you understand what what it is written here? What does it mean? Doing progressively more complex image processing. Kon bataega? Uh, sir, it means analyzing more and more uh, pictures which uh, have uh, a lot of objects. No, think... wrong. Uh, Dr. Tariq, I think assumption is that V1 is a high level uh, uh, segmentation, for instance, that the rest of the Vs are further more or more information extracted. To some extent, yes. Ji, uh, Walid Abdul Ghani. Uh, please pay attention to your mics. 
uh, you have to take the lecture. This is I, otherwise you will be mark absent. Nabil Sheikh. Uh, yes, sir. What does it mean? Okay, doing progressively more complex image processing. Sir, in my opinion, it is that at the beginning, we give simple images, speed it, and after that, we give it more complex images. Yeah, to some extent, yes. Uh, both of you are right, Nabil and uh, Abhi, who has given the first question. I think it was probably Yusuf or Walid. Um, yeah, so that is what it means. Ke you learn progressively. For example, if I am able to, if I am able to recognize this number, so I am actually doing a progressive classification task. What is the progressive classification task? I, I have, uh, I am able to detect first of all five, zero, four, one, nine, two, and on an individual basis, and then I am able to combine them to form one whole number. Okay, and I have knowledge about math, so I'm able to tell you okay, what kitni na, kitna, kitni kimat ki baat kar rahe. I'm able to tell the price, what's written here. Okay, that's what it means. So now it tells you how the human brain learns. The human brain learns in progressive stages. And uh, the, the things that you see here is, are exactly those. So it's not that okay, uh, I am able to, I am able to, say for example, if I teach you a very difficult concept, you will not get that in the first go. So that's probably V1 for you. But then you go listen to the lecture again, you see some YouTube videos, and then you uh, do some hands-on, you ask some people, you, you query me again and again on WhatsApp, and then you go to V2, V3, V4, V5, and then you are perfect on the concept. So you developed it progressively. So that's what it means, okay? So that's exactly what we use in machine learning. Uh, are you... So we carry in our heads a supercomputer tuned by evolution over hundreds of millions of years. So the brain is evolving. That's also from God, from Allah Ta'ala, uh, since millions of years. I don't know whether that, yeah, so that is true. And superbly adapted to understand the visual world, okay? Recognizing handwritten digits isn't easy. Rather, we humans are stupendously astounding good at making sense of what our eyes show us. So. Uh, Whatever we see, we recognize it, whether it's a scenery, whether it's rain, whether it's a car, uh, whether it is some person we know or we do not know, whether it's some new city or country, immediately we're able to detect and start functioning in that. Okay, and all that work is done unconsciously, so you can understand the power of the human brain. We do not realize that, but there's a big blessing of God. So that's why if something happens to your brain, uh, Allah maaf kare, so, it more most likely it results in death. Okay, like a brain tumor or a brain hemorrhage or whatever. So yeah, so now, now it, it's easy for us to do it, but what about computers? Okay, so let's say I have this number nine. So now if we talk about computers, then it's not easy. I want the computer to recognize this number nine. Okay, so how to do it? Because I can write nine like this, someone can write nine like this, someone can write nine like this, someone can put a very big circle and make a small line like this. So there are probably thousands of ways in which I can write a nine. I will be able to recognize all of these as nine, but what about the computer? So it's not going to be easy for the computer. So for example, one of the ways is, yaar, first detect a circle. So detect this circle, okay. Then detect the curved line attached with the circle. Now detect this curved line attached with the circle. Okay. Make sure that the curved line does not make a semicircle. So if this curved line makes a semicircle, then it becomes an eight. So I have to make sure that this does not happen. So I just do this. So learn a semi semicircle. Okay, so a half a semicircle which should start towards the right of the circle. Okay, because I can't have a nine like this, right? It's inverted. I, I need to start it from the right of the, of the circle. And it, it does not have to be a full semicircle. Uh, the semi should not be completely semi. So it should not be 50% semi, but it can be 60%. It can be 40%. So, I mean, there is no way I can teach a computer to detect a nine in this way, right? This is not a AI-based expert system in which I can write some rules 
एंड टेल द सिस्टम की अच्छा यार दिस इज हाउ यू डिटेक्ट नाइन दिस इज हाउ यू डिटेक्ट फाइव दिस इज हाउ यू डिटेक्ट जीरो इट्स नॉट गोइंग टू वर्क ठीक है तो देर इज नो वे आई कैन डिवेलप अ प्रोग्राम ऑन पाइथॉन और डॉट नेट टू मेक अ कंप्यूटर डिटेक्ट नाइन यू अंडरस्टैंड वाई वी यूज न्यूरल नेटवर्क नाउ बिकॉज वी कॉन्ट राइट अ प्रोग्राम फॉर दैट देर इज नो वे वी कैन डू दैट देर आर थाउजेंड ऑफ वेज इन विच वन कैन राइट अ नाइन आई कॉन्ट राइट a script which encapsulates all those thousands of ways and it's literally impossible for a computer to uh for me to to tell the computer all the possible ways and therefore it's not going to work like a like a simple point of sale application i can't do that right so i have to do some other things to to make sure that something else so what we did uh we took we copied from god okay we we copied the neural network which god gave us and then we reproduced that ke okay, acha yaar human mind is able to do that so the art artificial neural network will also be able to do that so that turned out to be right uh so artificial neural network is now able to do much much more than recognize hand digits is this thing clear yes sir ah yes sir yes sir ji okay sir. so right uh, so that is the thing with neural networks right uh, neural networks are useful for this kind of particular situation in which you cannot write a code in machine learning uh, i can write a code for data wrangling for data cleaning for eda for feature selection for using some algorithm i can write a code i can write a script but to make a computer recognize an image uh, or a digit for example which is a very simple image it's it's not possible for me to write code for that therefore i have to leave it to biological neural networks primarily uh, uh just just wait a bit yeah so primarily we take from the biological neural so anns are the only algorithms which can perform such recognition tasks with almost perfect accuracy so it's, you can go up to 99% now it's not a problem okay uh but the problem is that we need lots and lots of training examples uh in the case of multi layer perceptrons when we were dealing with shallow neural networks uh at that time the you know uh when i was in when i was in gik uh, we studied artificial neural networks as a course and the project we did was basically character recognition right so we just recognized uh, like the the uh, the, the first uh, five letters of the english alphabet so we had a grid like this we had a grid 30 by 30 grid and if you if you wrote something like that through a mouse for example so uh, it was able to say it's an a b c d e f i think it was the first five letters only and even then when we were giving the demo so it gave an error and it just faltered okay and uh, like the, the accuracy was not very good at that time because we did not give it too many training images okay so neural network were were working and in those days in 1990s they were they were doing good stuff but they did not become mainstream applications because the processing power was not there there were not that many images uh, the interest was also not not uh, not there that much because people were not people were simply not uh, uh, interested in simple letter recognition they wanted people they wanted the system to recognize names on checks for example that was the first deep learning application uh linet abhi aapne dekha na wo jo i told you about linet you are going to we are going to discuss we are, we are going to discuss that uh, when we do cnn inshallah so it, the linet application was basically for check uh recognition so check it was able to detect the amount and the signature and the name of the person who wrote the check or to whom the check was given a blah 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 and it was able to do that with a good accuracy so that was the first famous application which is still being used i think by many banks uh, so but before that it was not that that good okay because we need lots and lots of training images um so if we have lots and lots of training images then the neural network itself the neural network will learn the rules for recognizing each number itself uh, through its architecture Uh, that's the power of the neural network that's how it happens you can ask me that why it learns because we are we have just copied what god gave us <laughs> god gave us the architecture so we copied it so it's working for us so it's okay it's working for us 
but we have to realize is that how can we tune ANNs to perform in a good way? That's our task. Okay, that's that's not God's task. Our task is to do what, but to solve our own problems, right? Uh, with the help of uh, God, obviously. Uh, but uh, you know, ANN is in our hands. So how to tune the hyperparameters? How many layers to include? So lots and lots of room to experiment. Even now we are taking uh, the much guidance from the biological neural networks. So we cannot dictate these rules. The system will learn the rule itself. Keep that in mind. We cannot dictate these rules and we will never know what these rules are. We are just making a hypothesis. If this is what happens at the first layer, this is what happens at the second layer, this is what happens at the third layer. We're just making a hypothesis. Okay, we, we are not absolutely sure of what is happening at each layer and in each neuron of that, uh, of that layer. We are not absolutely sure. So keep that in mind. Yeah, we can monitor the output of those neurons always. But when I have uh, 500 neurons, when I have 1,000 neurons or 15,000 neurons, I don't have the time to monitor the output of each neuron. So I just forget about that and I just focus on the output. Okay, so that's what, what, that's what is happening. So through a brilliant execution of a series of mathematical equations, the result comes out, okay? So in the case of neural networks, we need to have thousands to millions of training examples. Uh, and, and that's not a problem because uh, now you can snap so many images, you know, of so many things. You can download so many images, which can, which can provide us training data. But again, uh, I told you, okay, it's, it's not that easy that as I'm saying, you need to process the images first through image processing. And uh, then you have to uh, provide those to the system to, to, to learn actually. Is, the, is this thing clear? All this thing is clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, what is happening here is, okay, uh, yeah. So this is the basic architecture of an artificial neural network, which I think uh, almost all of you are comfortable with now. Uh, in the first instance, we have the input layer, which I am typically associating with I. Uh, in which I give the data, the data for the sequence, the data for the images, um, the data for any textual corpus that you have that is given at the input layer. Uh, and then every, every deep learning network also has an output layer which can have one or more neurons, uh, depending on what you want from, the, from, the, from, the, from, from that uh, application. So that is typically given by the notation O, uh, so, and the architecture is primarily defined by the hidden layers, okay? So the, the, the basic learning happens at the hidden layers, uh, whether it is uh, object detection, image captioning, generation, blah, 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 whatever. So the basic work gets done because of the hidden layers. And there is a, there is a saying that the more hidden layers you add, uh, the better your performance will be. And uh, that saying is actually the reason deep learning is there. So deep learning means that you have at least two or more hidden layers. That's called deep learning. If you have one hidden layer, you are into the domain of uh, the traditional multi-layer perceptron. But if you have more than uh, one hidden layer, uh, two or more hidden layers, then that's primarily deep learning. Okay, so that's just one very weak definition of deep learning. Okay. And the hidden layer, obviously, notation is H1, H2, and H3. And you can also think of subscripts, like for example, uh, so I can I can call this as I1, and this is uh, like I2. Uh, I I don't have the tablet for this course because typically it's supposed to be a, a on-site course IN. So in, in this, I I can I can put this as H11 if you can put a notation for this. This can be, uh, let's say, H12, uh, because the first notation is for the hidden layer number, and the second is for the input neuron, okay? And this will be uh, obviously H1N, and this will be H1, uh, so it is, it is uh, making it for all of them. 
So we'll just uh, wait up. So I can't have this notation. So I, I will have to define the weights, obviously, now. So the, the weights can be defined like that. So uh, uh, all the uh, all the links that you see here are called edges, and every edge has a weight. Okay. So the architecture. I have the input layer. I have the output layer. I have two or more hidden layers in a deep layer network. Uh, how many neurons should I include in one architecture? There is no standard solution. You can start with 10, you can start with 15, you can start with five, you can start with 20. Uh, typically, it should be at least as much as the size of the input layer. That's also one recommendation that is given, but they, I do not think so that's a standard rule. Okay, so if I have, uh, I don't know, if I have 700, neurons in the input layer. So maybe I should have 800 neurons in the hidden layer. Uh, but I do not think so that's a standard rule. You can also start with 20, 25, 30, 35, etc, etc. Uh, a si logical sense ki hai, wo ye hai ke, um, I am giving you 700 pieces of information and you are saying yeah, you are only going to use, you are only going to transform them into 10 pieces of information. You are going to lose information. So therefore, it is better to have at least 700 neurons here as well. Do you understand the logic? So this is something which you need to experiment and see yourself. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I can't claim to be an expert in this, but uh, I think it should be at least as much as the size of the input layer. Okay. So this should be very useful when you do experiments with the convolution network. Um, what else? Uh, so yeah, so we were talking about the notation. So the learning, uh, talking about the learning here, so we talked about the neurons, so we replicate the biological neurons, so these are the processing units. I told you that each neuron, either it fires after charging or it remains sleeping, right? So how do you determine whether a neuron will fire or not? That is done through an activation function. Activation function can be a simple mathematical function, it can be sigmoid function, it can be hyperbolic tangent function. It can be any function from the sigmoid family. It can be a ReLU function. It can be a leaky ReLU function or maybe some other function. It can be uh, many, one of the possible activation functions which is Is this thing clear? Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Ah. So, sir, activation function. Every neuron, every neuron has an activation function. Every neuron. Every neuron has an activation function uh, through which it, it is, uh, we determine the output uh, of that neuron. The uh, activation function basically means that all the input that comes inside the neuron is uh, aggregated and it is given to the activation function. If the response of the activation function is, is according to its uh, division, for example, you can say if the total input is more than nine, then it should fire, otherwise it should not fire. Okay, if it is a sigmoid function, you can say okay, if the total input is more than 0.5, then it fires, otherwise it does not fire because that's what we have been doing in machine learning too as well, right? So just remember this, that a neuron has an activation function, especially the hidden layers and the output layer. What should happen at the input layer? Input layer, ka mujhe. Input layer mein, if I input an image, an image, let's say an image has 700 pixels, so how many neurons should be in the input layer? 700. Huh? Sir, 700. 700. So what will be the input value of these neurons? Sir, pixel. A pixel can take on a color, right? If I say a pixel has a maximum value of one, what is that color? I can't hear you properly, please. Sir, black. Ah, black. And if I say zero? 
वाइट वाइट सो अ पिक्सेल वैल्यू कैन वेरी बिटवीन वन एंड जीरो बिटवीन ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट इफ इट इज अ ग्रे स्केल इमेज ठीक है अगर वो कलर्ड इमेज है तो भाई क्या होगा सर आज जीबी टाइम कम्स so uh input ke andar the input goes as it is and gets multiplied by the weights sahi hai add the input layer the input layer mein jo pixel ki weights. value hai uh sir mera sawal tha ji ji पर इसमें वेट्स कैसे डिटरमाइन करते हैं सॉरी या उसका आप वेट्स डिटरमाइन कैसे करते हैं आप उसके बारे में बाद में बताएंगे हां द वी डू नॉट डिटरमाइन ये माइक ऑफ कर दे वी डू नॉट डिटरमाइन द वेट्स द वेट्स आर लर्नड बाय एन एल्गोरिथम व्हिच इज कॉल्ड बैक प्रोपगेशन वी जस्ट इनिशियलाइज द वेट्स रैंडमली बाय यूजिंग नॉर्मली डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड डेटा दैट्स इट वी जस्ट यूज अ पाइथन फंक्शन टू रैंडमली इनिशियलाइज ऑल द वेट्स in the uh, in the architecture and then we use the back propagation algorithm to update the weights and then we learn the uh, update updating the weights means that we are learning when the weight update is uh, converges then that means that the system has learned that's the that's the way we do it okay sir okay so what i'm saying is that the the input layer just passes on its value to the next line that is there the edge that is there okay the actual the actual activation function that is used is at the hidden layers and the output layer is this thing clear sahi hai ji dr kai ek ek sawal hai ke hidden layer और आउटपुट लेयर्स के एक्टिवेशन फंक्शन में फर्क हो सकता है के सबका सेम होना जरूरी है डिफरेंट हो सकते हैं टिपिकली इन ऑर्डर टू मेंटेन होमोजेनिटी वी जस्ट कीप वन एक्टिवेशन फंक्शन थ्रू आउट आर्किटेक्चर बट यू कैन यूज डिफरेंट एक्टिवेशन फंक्शंस एज वेल फॉर एग्जाम्पल एट दी आउटपुट लेयर आई कैन यूज दिगमोइड ओके uh and at the hidden layer i can use the relu function uh which is used uh, in primarily convolution neural networks and it can also be used in uh, you know it can also be used in other type of deep learning uh, algorithms so yeah it is possible to use different styles different ways sir is there any advantage to using different activation functions or not uh look the sigmoid function activation function is probably the best one because it is controllable you know it maps everything between 0 and 1 we know about that right we are doing that in ml2 uh it it depends on the usage uh, of what you want at the output uh, like i told you k uh, a sig sigmoid function typically works it typically works well but nowadays in convolution neural networks the relu function or the leaky relu function uh also works pretty good along with the hyperbolic tangent so yes there is an advantage but we cannot always determine that we just have to try it out and see different things from time to time there are there are only a, there are there are only three or four standard activation functions so we just have to experiment in those there are there is not a long list okay okay sir the standard ones are only three or four there is a long list but with we we don't we don't want to go into those details at this point of the course okay we can do that in the project uh so we talked about weights and then we have something which is called a bias which i will tell you later on what what is a bias when i tell you what the perceptron and so what happens is that you give the data here the data passes through that the activations happen some neurons fire some do not fire the output comes out and the output is obviously an error because your system has not learned so you take the actual value 
uh, you you find out an error function. I told you this ML2 about this error function, which is uh, we are representing as J theta. Uh, J is the error function in res uh, with respect to this hyperparameters theta. So we use this to basically do something which is called back propagation. So we propagate the error backwards all the way up to the hidden layer, all the way up to this input layer, you can say, so that I can update all the weights and all the biases of the network. When the rate of change of weights and biases converges, I mean, they're not changing by that much, then this means the system has learned. Tika, is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Error aata hai output yes, sir. I take that error and back propagate that through the whole network. The reason is to update the weights because updating the weight means learning and update the biases as well. Bias is also a type of weight. Okay. So I want to update the weights and I want to update the biases so that my system learns. When the <clears throat> rate of change of weights and biases decreases below a certain threshold. I mean, they're not changing by that much. Okay, you know, this is the So, if you have weights or biases, they are learning, input data, they are learning, their values are remaining almost the same, then it's time to stop the learning. Okay, is this thing clear now? Okay. Yeah. Haan, lekin, lekin, this like can happen. Ji? Sorry, your voice is not clear, please. Sir, I'm sorry. Ji, back propagation is not clear, please. Sir, I'm sorry. Ji, ji. I'm sorry. 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 I'm Sorry? This is this is this is just the starting. We will have to do all the formulas. We did some flavor of that. If you if you have taken the ML2 class last time, we did the back propagation in a very superficial, superficial way by using the partial derivatives. You have to do it through partial derivatives. Or why to cheese up cavalry me ani so please get ready for that. Abito is just the starting lecture. I'm just telling you the basic things. Uh so TK is is the basic idea clear? You feed forward the data as much as possible because you need the you need more and more data, and then you back propagate to learn why you back propagate. To update the weights so that the error will be minimized. To update the weights and the in such a way that uh, the the error will be minimized in the next uh, forward uh, layer. Update the weights and the biases as well. The bias is also a weight which we add ourselves because uh, they can try to understand that. Uh, sari note kar ye, next time humari, inshallah, on -site class hui, main chota sa quiz bhi le sakta uh, the point just try to visualize ke there are so many so many edges here you see ke you should have asked the question ke how do we connect one layer to the other layer what is the logic for connecting one layer to the other it seems here ke all the neurons in one layer is connected to all the neurons of the other layer right so this input neuron is connected to all the neurons of this hidden layer. Similarly, this hidden uh, layer neuron is connected to all the neurons that I can see here. Ditto for here and ditto for here. So there is, this is called a fully connected network. So this means you are adding more and more and more and more edges. The more edges you add, jitni, jitni edges add karenge, to kya add hoga? what is going to get added? Sir, weights increase. Ah, the yeah. more weights you add, the more edges you add, the more weights you add, the more neuron neurons you add, the more biases you add. So the more you have to struggle to learn the network. 
Okay, so a fully connected network can learn pretty good if you give it ample time and if you give it lots and lots of examples because us, uske jo weights hain, they will take time to converge. The weights of a fully connected network will take time to converge because they need lots and lots of data and because there are so many weights. It is possible to not have a fully connected network. For example, I can say, okay, yeah, I don't care. I, just, I will just say, okay, I just need a partial connection. So I'm going to connect each neuron in this layer to just half of the neurons in the other layer and just select them randomly. Just select them randomly. I can do that. So it's called uh, sparsity. They call it sparsity. So if there are 10 neurons in this layer, so every neuron, input neuron is connected to five neurons. Similarly, every neuron here is connected to five neurons here, if there are 10 neurons here, and so on and so forth. So in that case, the learning will be quick, but it would not might not that be that much accurate. So this is the game that you have to play from time to time. So that is why when you work with neural networks, uh, you try out different architectures, you try out different number of neurons, you try out different layers, you try out different activation functions, uh, along with some other hyperparametric settings. And obviously you see ke how much time your back propagation algorithm is taking. Um, and then you try to adjust as much as possible. So that's the game that you have to play here, okay? So hidden basically means neither input nor output. It does not have any uh, philosophical meaning or very technological meaning. It just simply means ke it's a layer which is neither an input layer nor an output layer. That's why it's called a hidden layer. Achha, um, jo hamare traditional neural networks, they we used, we used, we used to call them MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons. Okay, although they are not using the perceptron neuron because there are different types of neurons which make up an artificial neural network. One type is the perceptron, the other type is the sigmoid neuron, which is typically used in deep learning, not the perceptron. The perceptron actually laid the foundation of artificial neural network. The perceptron gave the concept, but now we have replaced the perceptron with sigmoid neurons mostly. So now we are working with those. Okay, is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Uh, so when, we, when I say multi-layer perceptron, that does not mean that I'm using only perceptron neurons. I am using this term even for sigma neurons. In fact, it, it, is, it is being used for sigma neurons more than for the perceptron because no one is using perceptron these days. They are very childish neural networks which are used basically for designing uh, logic gates. Okay, so we'll, we'll see now how that happens. Okay, uh, just just give me one minute. Okay, I'll come in one minute. In fact, uh, you guys can take a break for uh, 10 minutes. Okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. okay, so perceptrons were developed in the 1950s and 1960s by Frank Rosenblatt. Okay. Sir? Uh, G? Sir, yeah, perceptrons or the pichli side mein dekha tha, neurons, so they were ekhi cheez hain. You, you, will, you will come to know. Just aap, aap is slide ko sunne phir. And any any neuron, any neuron has an activation function, right? That's what we say. There can there cannot be a neuron without an activation function. So yeah, even if even if I say okay, your activation function is to just output what I give you, that is also an activation function. So every neuron has an activation function, and based on the activation function, we define different types of neurons. So the initial neural networks, they use the perceptron uh, neuron. Okay, so perceptron basically laid the foundation of artificial neural networks. So officially, the first type of neuron just come, get in, that was the perceptron. And that was given by Frank Rosenblatt in, uh, in USA. 
and this his work was inspired by Beck, Collage, and Pitts. So they also proposed a type of neural network or type of neurons, but uh, that is out out of scope of this course because perceptron is more important. What perceptron does is a perceptron is a neuron basically. I can combine several perceptrons together to form a perceptron neural network. Like uh, we can have a sigma neural network. A perceptron takes several binary inputs, x1, x2, so all of these are binary inputs, and produces a single binary output. Okay, is this thing clear? That's a perceptron. It takes a binary input and outputs a binary output. Uh, it was Rosenblatt who introduced the concept of weights. So he said that, okay, uh, the input that you're giving, just multiply by the weights. So this is W1, uh, this is W2, and this is W3. Take it clear. So, which are real numbers. So, real number means okay, they are from the real number space. So that means they can have take value from uh, minus infinity to positive infinity. And they will express the importance of the respective inputs to the output. Similarly to the way I showed you my grading scale. Okay. So you just assign weights to the important. So if this input is more important for me, I will put weight as uh, let's say 0 0.6. And if this is not, if this is extremely unimportant for me, I will put this weight as 0 0.1. And if this is a bit important to me, I will put this as 0 0.3. So the total of weights add up to one. Okay, clear okay, but. So the concept of multiplying the input by the way it was given by Rosenblatt uh, in the perceptron network. That's what we do even now, okay? The neurons output zero or one, because in the case of perceptron, our output is always binary. This is determined by whether the weighted sum is greater than some threshold value. That's it. So if the weighted sum is less than or equal to threshold, then the neuron is zero. What does this mean that the neuron is zero? G. Maria, what does it mean that the neuron is, uh, uh, that the output is zero? Sir, huh? Maria Baloch. Rabia West. Uh, I think all are taking classes from their offices. So who will tell me what does this mean? So that the neuron uh, doesn't uh, shoot or. Uh... Yeah, the neuron does not fire. That's the word you use, fire. The neuron either fires or not. So it does not fire. So it does not fire. And obviously when it is one, that means that the neuron fires. So fire means it passes on the information to the next layer. If the neuron fires, it gives a signal. It passes on the signal to the next layer. Okay. If that does not fire, it does not give anything to the next layer. Okay, is this thing clear? Yes. Yes, ah, So that's yes, how the perceptron works. So remember in the case of perceptron, we have binary inputs and we have binary outputs. We need to define a threshold value so that we can determine whether a neuron fires or not. The threshold is up to us, so it's a, it's a, it's a business decision. So it's basically a perceptron is primarily a device or a computer program, you can say that makes decisions. Why is that? How is it making a decision? Yeah, how is it making a decision? Using activation function? Yeah, through the activation function, but uh, talk in more realistic terms. What, what is the decision that is being made here? Assuming input to base clip, we have to do the same thing. So, we have to do the same thing. And if the activation function is 5, then we have to do the same thing. So, if we have to do the same thing, we have to do the same thing. We have to perform the same thing. Otherwise, we have to do the same thing. I mean, yes. Uh, decision is the firing one, right? Should I fire or not? If I fire, then that means I have energy, I have evidence which is highly weighted, which has been given to me, it is enough for me to fire. 
so i am making a decision i am firing okay so that you can you can equate it with this your own human decision making we'll see an example right now so a device or a computer program that makes decisions by weighing up the evidence that's the word weighing up the evidence so what's the evidence the evidence is the training data okay i weigh up the evidence based on what is more important for me and what is less important and that i used to make a decision should i fire or not okay so for example if i have the decision to make should i take a loan from the bank for a new car i have to make this decision right should i do it or not should i fire or not for this particular task so what are the inputs do i really need a car zero or one okay is there ample time for me to return the loan based on the terms and conditions no or yes i need it interest free no or yes so there might be some people who will say okay i don't care about interest theek hai and there will be lots of people who will say okay i care about interest i don't want to pay it okay so all these three things are binary inputs and the people can fluctuate their preferences based on these three inputs okay so now what is what is more important for me for example do i really need a car one i need a car is there ample time for me to return no, zero i don't think so there is ample time for me but i still need a car i need it interest free one so i have one zero one as the input for that's for me maybe for any one of you it is going to be different what about the weights so for 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 me um, the interest free thing is a weight of 50% and the rest two are 25 25% okay so what's going to happen so i have uh, 1 into 0.25 plus 0 Plus one into point five, so point five plus point two five, point seven five. So if my threshold is point six, for example, then I fire and say, okay, take a loan. Okay, and uh, if if someone is saying zero zero one, okay, zero zero one, okay, I don't really need a car. I don't think there's enough time, but I need it interest free. If my loan is interest free, then that is zero zero one. So his total aggregated input is point five, based on the weights. so this is not going to fire because he does not really need a car uh, he thinks there is not enough time so why should he get the car so he is below the threshold so he does not fire so in this case you just just see a perceptron is is allowing you to simulate your human decision making by weighing up evidence based on your own preferences so everyone has his own weights if i give that if i give you data so for example you may say okay, interest free for me is 30% i really need a car that is 50% and the second one is 20% maybe that's someone's else someone else's weights so you can imagine the different possible scenarios that can happen with a perceptron with a simple perceptron is this in clear yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. ah so vary the weights and thresholds to get different models of decision making that's the thing so you can vary the weights you can vary the inputs and you get different models of decision making so that's where the perceptron can help you make a decision that's a very simple decision because why it is so simple because things are binary that is the reason okay so i can form a layer of perceptron network so i right now i was just looking at one perceptron so i can have a layer so this is first layer second layer third layer obviously the input layer is here this is the input layer this is the first hidden layer this is the second hidden layer this is the output layer okay so first layer perceptron is making three very simple decisions by weighing the input evidence each perceptron in the second layer is making uh, i think uh, this is the input layer probably i'm not really sure yeah so this is the input layer this is the hidden layer so all of this is the hidden layer yeah so each perceptron in the hidden layer is making a decision by weighing up the results from the first layer of decision making samajh aage baat ki this is what you need to keep in mind okay the layer built up on the data from the previous layer so that is why neural networks are so famous because they are able to learn progressively that's what we were discussing at the start of the lecture today that you want progressive learning first learn this then learn this then learn this then learn the whole thing so that becomes possible through these layers that's why god has made us uh, for us these layers because that it becomes possible through these layers 
that's the best thing you can have so we are we replicate the same thing and it is working alhamdulillah for us uh, so when we uh, make decision making at different layers then what happens is that we make a decision at a more complex and more abstract level than perceptrons in the first layer okay the first layer is this layer so it learns something which is really basic the second layer hidden layer is this layer it learns something which is more complicated maybe there's a third hidden layer it learns something which is even more complicated and then finally i'm able to recognize something and make a decision okay so that's why the perceptron uh, the, the idea of the perceptron was very famous and it became very famous and uh, at that time you know people started to think that okay it's, it's a huge thing and uh, we are going to invest a lot of money in this and this is going to happen that is going to happen the problem was that uh, rosenblatt did not propose the back propagation algorithm so when when he was asked to you know replicate the perceptron over a network like this uh, what you are seeing right now because he he used to explain things you know in basic perceptron neuron level okay or just a few few, few perceptron neurons but when we talk about a neural network consisting of three or four hidden layers then you know you need to propose a formalism for updating the weights that was back propagation but at that time in 1950s that was not there so people became very much interested initially in perceptron but later on they stopped funding it because they said that this is a uh, this idea cannot go ahead because uh, there is no way we can learn the weights okay so in 1970 someone came up with the back propagation algorithm and he showed that this could happen and then the neural network research started from there so neural network is also one of the initial machine learning algorithms one of the most initial machine learning algorithms along with decision trees okay is this thing clear yes sir. yes sir and even more complex decisions can be made by the perceptron in the third layer a many layer network of perceptrons can engage in sophisticated decision making so that is the i don't want to use the term but that is magic okay that is magic because uh, we are taking this from the biological uh, scenario and it is working for us in a good way that's how the learning is happening but still we have absolutely no control over uh, you know what happens uh, but except the back propagation algorithm you can try to change the back propagation algorithm it which chooses very concrete mathematics uh, and that is going to update the way the weights are updated uh but other than that we don't have much control we can just form the architecture and do our stuff yeah we have control over the hyperparameters so there are some notational changes so one is the thing ke instead of writing it like this i write it as a dot product so w dot x means ke i multiply the input by the weight so uh, if i have this for example for any neuron the input that is coming in every input because this input could be coming from a neuron in the previous layer so just remember this ke ye baat please aap log zara dhyan se sun le the neuron in the previous layer has an activation which comes out of here is that fine is this correct or not ji sir so, yeah every neuron so repeat karega every neuron in the input layer sorry okay i messed it up just wait let's say i have this neuron in some specific layer and i have data coming i have a link coming here i have three neurons putting data into this neuron from the previous layer sahi hai is this thing clear i'm just telling you a part of the network what i'm saying is that if this if this neuron will fire what will happen is it going to output some number yes one sir. yes sir yeah so that is the activation like in this this is the number which is going to output the, the yeah. dot product okay so you multiply the dot no not the dot product but actually the, uh, the activation actually which is one. xj 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 yeah the x x is the activation which comes out from this one and w is this one okay <clears throat> yes sir so i multiply each activation of the previous layer 
by the weight of this layer, by, uh, by the weight of this edge, plus activation multiplied by the weight of this edge, plus activation of this multiplied by the weight of this edge. I write all of these things as this. Okay, is this thing? By the way, please get comfortable with the notation. Otherwise, you are going to face problems later on. So basically, W dot X means your matrices are in the middle. Vectors, basically. Yeah, vectors, 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 vectors. Vectors. Okay. So if this is W one, W two, W three, so I have the I have the vector here. W one, W two, W three. And I also have the transpose of x. So basically, I take the transpose if I want to do the dot product. So x one can be, for example, one two three. So these can be the three activations from the three neurons, and this can be, let's say, four five six, just for a toy example. The weights can be four five six. So one into four plus five into two plus six into three. So that's the dot product. Okay. one of the vectors has to go transpose for the multiplication sahi hai yes sir ha ji sir le liye algebra yaad aa gayi ha ya dekhe bhai abhi to bahut kuch chalna hai aage theek hai to ye cheeze yaad kar le acha now the other thing is that we have this threshold value na i told you that the threshold is basically for to help in our decision making right i i will put the threshold myself because i want to control the way the the neural network is learning i cannot leave everything to back propagation and wait updates because then i lose control so i take the threshold and take the negative of that and put that as the bias every neuron has a bias except the input neurons input uh, besides the uh, Uh, neurons in the input layer every neuron has a bias uh, the hidden layers in the hidden layers every neuron has a bias and at the output layer every neuron has a bias the bias is there because i want to be able to control the way the network is is going along so i can introduce a value for the bias it is just a, it is just uh, the threshold which has been negative so is this thing clear because this uh, perceptron equation jo na it's we want to able to generalize sir wo bias wali cheez dobara samjha de dekhiye okay, uh, i want to i want to generalize this equation right okay you understand this equation right ke threshold is something which the human sets okay yes yeah, sir so threshold is something in, in the case of neural networks i don't call it a threshold i call it the bias threshold is the name which i gave in the name in the case of perceptron only if i am taking a single uh, if i am talking about a single use case uh, right like for example uh, a single neuron jo ki humne examples abhi piche dekhi hain in that case i can say threshold but if i talk of a neural network i have to use the term bias and bias is the negative of the threshold but why is it the negative of the threshold matlab why मतलब अगर इफ यू जस्ट चेंजिंग टर्मिनोलॉजी तो हमने उसको मतलब बायस थ्रेशोल्ड को बायस क्यों कह रहे हैं नेगेटिव नेगेट क्यों करने की जरूरत पड़ रही है उसे अह लुक एट दिस इक्वेशन आई एम राइटिंग w डॉट x प्लस b आई एम एडिंग द बायस बट बायस इज नेगेटिव थ्रेशोल्ड बिकॉज़ व्हेन आई टेक द थ्रेशोल्ड हियर आई हैव टू माइनस इट राइट सो बायस इज in fact minus t bias is minus t but i write that as plus b so when i when i train the neural network i am not thinking about the threshold value at all ke bias is negative threshold i have to put the minus sign no 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 i just give a random value of bias and i start training it is just for explaining to you that i where if you ask me ke bias kahan se aa gaya where did this bias come from i will tell you that this is just the threshold which is which is how the neural network work because the perceptron has taught us how the neural network will work so i have to include the threshold that is why i put the bias cheek so, is sir sir so, mere bias related do sawal hain ab abhi just let me finish this slide then you can ask okay so 
you can imagine yourself what is happening here. So I just put an extra term here, which is primarily the threshold. So it is a measure of how easy it is to get the perceptron to fire. I, I want to be able to control a bit if, when the perceptron will fire. I cannot force it, but through the bias, I, what is what am I doing? Basically, this is my actual input, right? W dot X. This is what is actually I have. I am adding one number to it. I'm adding one number to it with the hope that it will fire. Okay, because I want to be able to control the things because that's the threshold. So I am hopeful that by introducing the bias for each particular neuron, or if I don't want to learn the bias value for each particular neuron, I can, I can learn it for 50% of the neurons, but I do have to learn the ideal bias value. But by learning the bias value, because I also have to learn the ideal bias value, you will see in back propagation in the next class, I have to learn the ideal bias value as well. So in the ideal bias value, uh, I am basically trying to manipulate the algorithm a bit. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to manipulate the algorithm so that the neuron will fire. As I know, okay, my heart cheese weights go for short doom or what weights woke on car better joke. Woke on car any joke. I can not charge on so much. Mary, but key. I think. You can see for a perceptron with a really big bias, it's extremely easy for the perceptron to fire. Look at this equation. If the bias is very big on the positive side, forget about this negative threshold. Just forget about this. Just remember K, I have taken the threshold as the bias in the generalized neural network formulation. So if the bias is very big, what is going to happen? Positively, negatively. Positively, obviously, in this equation, if the bias is very big, what are the chances that the output is going to be greater than zero? Are they going to be more or less? More, sir. More, more chances more. to so fire. It's easy, it will be easy for fire. If the bias is very low, then what is going to happen? And less chances to fire. Less chances for the person to fire. So, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Based on the value of the bias, I can control the firing of the neuron, right? The value of the bias can help the neuron to fire or not fire. So based on the value of the bias, which varies between 0 and 1, I have some control over the firing of the neuron. Now, the problem is that when I start the neural network, I do not know the ideal value of the weight and the ideal value of the bias. I learn these values through back propagation. Okay. So then you will say, okay, why have you, why have you inserted the bias? If you don't know the ideal value, so I am saying, okay, I want the neural network to consider that the bias is there because that is part of the perceptron formulation, which is the root of neural networks. The neural network will learn the value of the bias itself and the value of all the weights. Okay, and the fact that the biases are there are going to help the neural network fire or not fire. It is going to have a very positive impact on the final output. That has been experimented. TK, is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Sir, what is our usual practice when we add a bias? Sorry? Because if we... Sir, what is usually our practice when we add a bias? If we add a bias, then there will be confusion. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, always always remember uh, if you are initializing some parameter you always initialize that uh, through a uniform distribution uh, mostly you initialize the data through a random normal distribution you never give it some specific value but typically aap apne weights or biases ko random normal distributed data se initialize karenge you are not going to initialize that using 0 or 1 or 1 1.2 1 1.3 yourself because you never, that could be biased. That could be biased. So you let the system update the, uh, initialize the data. Sir, we have seen a car loan example de thi, a few slides back. We have weight assign that we have done normal distribution se technically or something like that. No, no, no. That was just to explain you. That was just to explain you ke how neural networks work. You have to multiply the input by the weight. 
find out the aggregate and then compare with the threshold. That was just to explain you. We are talking of deep learning in which we have to deal with millions of neurons or maybe hundred thousands of neurons. And we will not have to this luxury of the perceptrons. There are not going to be perceptrons. We are going to be dealing with sigboard neurons. Okay? Taki Apu Pata Chaljake, neural networks, how do they work? These are WX plus B greater than or equal to zero or greater than zero. That's how they work. That's the basic formula that I use. So either output it is going to not fire or it is going to fire. That's the main thing that you need to keep in mind. Okay. Um, so I've just replicated the, the same thing here. Just wait. So, ah, so let's, uh, let's see what is, what is happening here. Let's say I put the weight as minus two and minus two here. And uh, let's say okay, I want the perceptron to replicate a logic gate. So logic gate, I have two inputs. Uh, not even able to control. Let me just draw with this. X1. X2. This is horrible, yeah. Okay, just let me just draw like this. X1 and X2. And this is the output. So let's say I have this neural network. So the weights are given to me. And let's say I'm implementing a gate. So a gate can have four possible inputs, like zero, zero. We, 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 we taught K perceptron have binary inputs, right? So these are the four possible binary inputs of this neural network. Now tell me what is going to be the output. What is the threshold of this neuron? G. Uh, three. Three is the threshold, very good. What is going to be the output of this row? Zero. It, it won't fire. It won't fire. Good. What about this one? Minus two. Won't fire. Output is either zero or one. Achha, ha, say zero, zero. Zero. Minus two. Is it going to fire or not? No, sir. No, sir. No. What about this one? No. No, sir. No, Zero. Sir. And this one? No, sir. Zero. Uh, no. It shouldn't. Zero. It should be zero. Zero. It should be zero. So what is happening? Starting on each NAND gate, like how Siga you per or like in apparently NAND kya hota hai wo function. It is opposite to the AND when AND is zero one 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 zero. Nay, 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 just uh, let exactly me cross check K zero into minus two zero zero. This is uh, if it is less than threshold, less than three. So it's never going to be three. Sir, my opinion is that we have to adjust the weights and adjust the threshold. Uh, I think we will add bias add minus 2 into 0 and we will add minus 2 into 0 and we into 0 and we will add minus 2 into 0 x 1 into 0 x 2 into 0 minus 2 into 0 minus 2 0 plus 3 is plus 0 plus 3 is 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 0 plus that's good. Let's clear the confusion. So because we standardize this, right? To standardize, we are going to use this one. Okay. So this is primarily the NAND gate. 
which uh, one of you has or more one or more if you have read, uh, rightly recognized it but septrons can be used to compute any logical function and the reason for that is k the nand gate is a universal gate and any computation can be built out of that for example if you have to build a architecture to add two numbers so this is the adder network that is built through gates in a digital logic design course and you can convert that to this perceptron network okay in which i have two outputs one is for the i think uh, uh, sum and the other is for the carry bit which is x1 into x2 so i can do that i can even i can even merge these two inputs together because it does not make sense to have two inputs uh, from the same neuron to the same neuron okay so i can merge these inputs together and combine their bits so if it is point 2 here and point 2 here so i can make one line of point 4 okay is this thing clear so uh, one of the uh, major uses of perceptron is in the design of uh, logical function gates that is what you need to keep in mind but uh, for the uh, for the applications jo ke hame chahiye absolutely not ठीक है, we are not uh, that much. Uh, perceptron cannot help us at all. But perceptron has laid the foundation of the neural network, so we are now clear on the concepts of W X plus B uh, uh, activation functions, the architecture, etc., etc. Okay. So now you see that. that is where it came from like the the perceptron was being used for uh, this designing logical uh, gates and all the functions all the function related to that but what happened was that when this happened then people realized that uh, it is now possible to devise learning algorithms remark this word which can automatically tune the weights and biases of an an and that was not there in the in the days of perceptron can anyone tell me why sir wo backdrop nahi thi pehle nahi 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 bhai us zamane mein sir mein ye the net the neural networks were so simple that i could use the values of weights myself right i could use <coughs> some uh, default values of weights and it worked for me that the neural networks were pretty simple like yahan pe what it gives this is a pretty simple neural network i can simulate that it in any in any programming language like matlab which was probably there at that time as well or maybe some other c language or whatever so this is a pretty simple architecture it it has it is nothing complicated right it's just a few weights and there is uh, the bias also is controllable the weights are controllable so it's possible for me there's no need for learning the weights and biases the the problem became complicated when people started to talk about handwritten recognition and a robot you know that in 1950s they started to talk about robots in 1950s and 60s so there was no way a robot could learn without back propagation without reinforcement learning for example so it died out they said that this is not working so you cannot solve basic problems except nand gates and you know uh, the logic gates that's why it died out but they it gave them the idea that we need to do something to make the weights and biases learnable and that happened in 1970s okay is this thing clear you need to be very clear on this this happens yes, in sir. response to external yes, stimuli the external stimuli are basically the hyperparameters the input data that you are giving and the back propagation algorithm so the neural network will learn by itself you don't need to take any worry or or any tension about how it will learn why it will learn how much time it will take so the neural network will learn and give you the response provided you are doing the right thing which is uh, not always easy you know to get that okay okay so now we are on to sigmoid neurons what is that
search is the activation function sigmoid i was i think that's the only mm-hmm. difference in this sigmoid is a family of functions remark that we have uh we have done this uh, kya kehte hain uh logistic function right yes sir in ml2 so logistic function is just one type of sigmoid function sigmoid is a family now the point is ki yaar when we have the perceptron when uh, when we are able to have networks like this one okay why you are why you want to put the activation function as the sigmoid function why so we want to be able to do that because we want to control things हमारे हमारे कंट्रोल में न्यूरल नेटवर्क कुछ भी नहीं देता है तो वी इंसर्टेड द बायस ओके एंड नाउ वी वांट टू बी एबल टू कंट्रोल इट फर्दर तो व्हाट इज द कंट्रोल दैट वी वांट वी वांट टू बी वी वांट द न्यूरल नेटवर्क टू टू बी कंट्रोलेबल सच दैट अ स्मॉल चेंज इन एनी वेट और बायस कॉजेज अ स्मॉल चेंज इन द आउटपुट दैट्स द माइक्रो मैनेजमेंट वी वॉन्ट a small change in any weight or bias causes definitely should cause a small change in the output again if i make a small change in any weight or bias of the neural network it should definitely cause a small change in the output that means things are controllable kya khayal hai bhai you 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 seen the example yes, where we are running अगर हम ये that a small change in the weights and biases is going to change the output definitely definitely going to change it then that means ke we can control the network in any way you want okay for example if the neural network is recognizing 9 we can uh, tune it to recognize 8 because 9 is similar to 8 in the sense ke this is 9 and if i just complete the semi circle here so this becomes a 8 Okay, so if I if I if I use such activation functions which will allow this to happen, then these things conversion will become controllable for me. Uh, actually, I am not. Is maybe my hand holding me कर रहा हूँ. I will not be forcing the neural network to convert from nine to eight, convert from eight to zero. No, no, no. I am just doing what I can do. I can do the activation function. I am using the activation function. i can introduce the bias i introduce the bias i can use drop out i will do your drop out i can use batch normalization i will use batch normalization i am just trying out different things but the whole concept is the same that i want to be able to control the output through the hyperparameters is this thing clear that is the whole concept behind deep learning you need to be able to experiment now if when now when you do the hands on you will know that why hyperparameter tuning is essential because you will know a yeah, small change in the hyperparameters should affect the output and that's what i want to happen because i want the output to be controllable i don't want any fixed set of in uh, hyperparameter which has already been tuned clear is this thing clear now uh, yes, yes sir. sir okay lekin there is a catch here a small change in weights and biases can also cause a large change in the output <laughs> with so many mathematical equations going on in these lines theek hai so there is no guarantee ab to hum keh rahe na ki chhota change hai to wahan bhi chhota ho jayega so what will happen is ke uh, you will be making some small change here for example weights and biases may you might be making some small change bias is typically given like this to each neuron bias so this could be b1 b2 b3 so you can talk about the subscripts jo bhi hai ठीक है, so we can talk about this. So what will happen is that you can make small changes here, but the neural network is very good recognizing eight, and suddenly it stops recognizing it. It's a big change. It stops recognizing it, and it starts recognizing something which is really strange, which is something like not even an eight, not even a nine, something like this. That can also happen. So how to control it? So that can only be controlled. 
through the activation functions okay so we can control that using the sigmoid neurons why sigmoid neurons are controllable because of this function uh, by the way uh, this is the notation that we use for an activation function please keep that in, uh, keep that in mind we are going to be using this sigma uh, i think this is sigma right we are going to be using the sigma sign to represent the activation function and z is actually wx plus b okay please keep this in mind z equals to w x plus b we are going to be using that by representing z and sigma is the activation function so sigma z means ke i am inputting this whole input to the activation function okay is this in clear yes sir ha ah. so they are similar to perceptrons but ha ah, now my question is ke why it is controllable through the sigmoid shavas jaldi jaldi bataye come on because sir wo discrete outputs no okay go ahead sir wo 0 to 1 mein map kar dega isliye 0 to 1 ke yeah, yeah, so function is so famous in neural networks because it controls the output that is what we want we want the output to be controllable that is why sigmoid neurons are so famous okay sir zara fir se repeat karenge sigmoid kyun control kar sakta hai because the sigmoid has this shape right s shape so whatever input you give to the sigmoid at the x level it is always going to be output a value between 0 and 1 so yes my my do the the last last uh 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 bilkul bilkul so it is very similar to the perceptron at the extremes if z is very large this is the equation which i translated here अगर ये इफ z इज वेरी लार्ज देन व्हाट हैपेंस e टू द पावर माइनस जीरो व्हाट इज दैट वन ओके वन ओवर वन इज वन सो एक्टिवेशन बिकम्स वन द न्यूरॉन फायर्स इफ z इज वेरी लार्ज इफ z इज वेरी स्मॉल देन e टू द पावर माइनस माइनस समथिंग ऑफ अ लार्ज वैल्यूज बिकम्स व्हाट सर एक बहुत बड़ा नंबर या तो ऑलमोस्ट जीरो वन ओवर अ बहुत बड़ा नंबर इज ऑलमोस्ट जीरो सो एट द एक्सट्रीम्स द बिहेवियर इज एक्जेक्टली इक्वल टू द परसेप्ट्रॉन एट द एक्सट्रीम्स इफ दैट इज वेरी लार्ज द न्यूरॉन फायर्स इफ दैट इज वेरी स्मॉल द न्यूरॉन डज नॉट फायर बट इट इज इन बिटवीन दैट वी वांट बिकॉज एट द देखिए एक्सट्रीम सिचुएशन तो इट्स इट्स गुड टू डिफाइन द एक्सट्रीम सिचुएशन बट थिंग्स आर नॉर्मली हैक occurring in between okay so that's what we want to be controllable so that is the variation that we can control so this is the sigma function that you already most of you already know about so this is what squash is between 0 and 1 remember uh, this is the asymptote here so it, it, it tends towards 0 and tends towards 1 it never becomes actually 0 or 1 sigmoid function is actually derived from the step function ye shayad maine aapko itna clearly ml2 mein nahi bataya tha sigmoid function is derived from the step function step if i take the step function then sigmoid is equal to the perceptron that that is uh, what we discussed just in the last slide but sigmoid family of function is derived from the step function which is a very famous function in signals signal systems and other related fields okay so that's what you need to keep in mind uh so we need to sum sum over all the weights and biases yeah so this is how we are doing it we have we have been talking about the fact ke the output of the the the, the output uh, the the output layer the output at the output neuron should be controllable by making small changes in weights and biases a small change in weight and bias should be able to make a small change in the output that was the statement right Uh, yes sir ah so that was the statement so in this case how will that happen that will happen through this equation so who will explain this equation to me 
it's a very simple so this is a very simple equation what what is the equation telling me uh, sir sender uh, v out output or v change is partial derivative of a to jo bhi change hoga usko sum kar denge sath mein the change jo hai output ka in fact jo bias ki wajah se ho raha hai usko bhi hum yani partial derivative denge aur usko bhi jo se hum mutalik change karenge jo delta b se show ho raha hai aur uske against jo fir hamare paas aa raha hoga wo hamare paas final output ban jayega to as in ke weights ko hum alag compute kar rahe hain out ke output ke upar weight ka kya change hoga और बाइस का चेंज वो सेपरेट ही कर रहे हैं दोनों को सम करके फिर वो आउटपुट पे शो कर रहे हैं आ काफी हद तक सही है हु हु विल गिव इट अ ट्राई सर बेसिकली इसमें हम ओवरऑल ओवरऑल चेंज देख रहे हैं वेट्स और बायसेस की वजह से अब जो हमारा जो भी चेंज आएगा फर्स्ट स्टेप में वो सिग्मॉइड फंक्शन की वजह से आएगा और जो फर्स्ट चेंज होगा वो वो भी वैसे भी स्मॉल ही होगा तो जितना स्मॉल चेंज होगा तो हमारे पास आउटपुट भी स्मॉल ही होगा क्योंकि वो सिग्मॉइड फंक्शन का आउटपुट आ रहा है जिससे एक्टिवेट एक्टिवेशन फंक्शन है बिल्कुल दिस आउटपुट इज बीइंग गिवन बाय द एक्टिवेशन फंक्शन जस्ट देखिए लर्न टू ट्रांसलेट इक्वेशन इज टेलिंग मी द आउटपुट ऑफ द आउटपुट इज डिफाइंड बाय द रेट ऑफ चेंज ऑफ ईच वेट विद रिस्पेक्ट टू द आउटपुट प्लस द रेट ऑफ चेंज ऑफ each bias with respect to the output and i when i sum up uh, when i sum up the rate of change of each weight and each bias then that becomes equivalent to the rate of change of output sahi hai so just keep this in mind if i if i have a network like this say i have for example some some basic uh, let's say i have a few layers here i have a few layers here one layer here one layer this is the neuron at the output layer just one neuron and i have let's say 23 total weights and i have let's say 21 biases i have total 21 neurons so i have 21 biases so in this case um what is the case ke the rate of change of these 23 weights with respect to the output and how we will compute that to the partial derivatives how is that going to happen we will see in detail in the next class because we have to write inshallah the chain equation uh, the equation through the chain rule to understand completely how it is derived okay so the rate of change of 23 weights multiplied uh, added with the rate of change of 21 biases is going to give me the rate of change of this output neuron that is what we wanted a small change in the weight and bias should bring out a small change in the output now mera sawal ab ye hai ki why the output is going to change by a small amount uh, ji sir kitna hamara jo sigmoidal function hai wo zero aur one ke darmiyan rahega ha because we are using the sigmoid function as simple as that before we were not using a sigmoid function so it was not controllable but now we are using a sigmoid function so it is controllable for us in the sense that we have brought it in a particular range the other the other point that you should keep in mind is that this is a linear combination which make things very simple so the change in the output is a linear combination of the change of the weight and the change of the bias that they, that makes sim- things very simple if it was a quadratic relationship then it would be difficult for us this is not a linear co- this is a simple linear combination like an equation of a straight line so the output delta the output delta output the change of the output is a linear function of the change of weights and the change of beta uh, change of bias now based on this controlling the output neuron change is more easy as compared to perceptron do you understand this as compared to perceptron now controlling the rate of change of output is very easy based on the rate of change of weights and biases because i am using the sigmoid function and another easy thing is that the rate of change of output is defined as a linear combination of the rate of change of weights and biases that makes things very manageable for me because now i can compute those partial derivatives to basically calculate this rate of change 
or in other in other words to uh, update the weights to minimize the error that's what we use it for theek hai is isme ko clear confusion hai ji you need to be ha uh, you need to be clear on these concepts if it is not clear then listen to the video again so when activation functions change pds change pds kya hote hain partial derivative partial derivative yes when activation function change partial derivative change so if you change the activation function then obviously because we are taking the partial derivatives here for example of the output so output is defined by the activation function so obviously the partial derivative values will change so different activation functions will have different uh, partial derivatives and we will need thresholding of the sigma if you remember correctly we uh, we we uh, talked about setting a threshold of 0.5 for the sigma function so if it is the output is more than 0.5 then we say that neuron has fired that the output is 1 otherwise the output is 0 but that can be controlled very easily that's not a problem so yeah so that is the difference between the perceptron neurons and the sigmoid neurons that is what you need to keep in mind and the, the sigmoid neuron is what we are using mostly as compared to the perceptron neurons so now we are do successes and then we will finish this lecture uh, i also need you to tell me ki whether you guys are available on sunday night for 1.25 hours only from 9:30 to 10:45 because i yes, plan to, i plan to take some sessions like this because we need to cover up the course i'm sorry for this but my health is not uh, good right now i'm i'm feeling weak basically so i have to take the classes like this so but uh, i'll put this in the group and then ask okay so okay, better yahi puch le warna group mein bada mushkil hoga ye puchna nahi nahi wo puchna mushkil hoga decision lena aasan hoga acha group mein start kar le theek hai i will take the decision then theek hai so now exercises suppose we take all the biases and weights in a network of perceptron so consider ke we have a network of perceptron in which we have one hidden layer okay we multiply all the weights and biases by a constant zero uh, sorry constant c which is greater than zero so let me let me draw the network on the whiteboard then that's probably what we have to show we have to show that the behavior of the network does not change uh okay so ab sahi mathematics aayi hai na jab show show ka lafz istemal ho gaya ha wo show aap log karenge na eh wo i will take the hidden layers as uh, the as same as the input layer so let me uh, make it make it fully connected okay so this uh, this probably going to complicate things like in what we can do okay and then this all these things are coming here and this is so if this is the perceptron then everything is binary okay so here i have one and zero here also i have one or zero so an input layer does not have any biases so the bias is here so that is b1 b2 <laughs> and i have b3 so i think oh sorry about that this is a horrible three year and obviously this is the output that we are looking for 
so uh, i think what what you need what you guys need to do is okay, you define the uh, take out your copy and pencil right now uh, and uh, think about what what it is telling you so you we we also need a notation uh, sir वैसे तो i think jo mujhe samajh aaya hai it's basically because the values themselves are discrete to basically formal proof mein ye dikhana chahiye ki bhai because any constant greater than 0 multiplied by 0 always equals 0 ठीक है एंड एनी कांस्टेंट ग्रेटर देन 0 मल्टीप्लाइड बाय 1 विल ऑलवेज इक्वल दैट कांस्टेंट ठीक है एंड बिकॉज़ द थ्रेशोल्ड इज सेट ऑन ग्रेटर देन 0 इज इक्वल मतलब अगर ग्रेटर देन 0 आपकी कैलकुलेशन में आया एक्टिवेशन फंक्शन है दैट मींस 1 एंड लेस देन 0 अगर आया तो दैट मींस लेस देन इक्वल टू 0 दैट मींस आउटपुट 0 दो तो दैट दैट इज द प्रूफ के हमेशा अगर कांस्टेंट सी ग्रेटर देन 0 से मल्टीप्लाई कर दें आउटपुट पे फर्क नहीं पता चलेगा बस इस बात को फॉर्मल नोटेशन में लिखना जरा मुश्किल है लेकिन ये आई थिंक दैट शुड बी द प्रूफ हां बिल्कुल आई आल्सो एग्री विद दैट बिकॉज़ द इनपुट्स आर ऑलवेज बाइनरी सो इफ यू मल्टीप्लाई अ नंबर 1 बाय अ नंबर व्हिच इज ग्रेटर देन 0 सो इट इज ऑलवेज इट इज गोइंग टू गिव यू दैट नंबर इटसेल्फ एंड इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू मेक एनी डिफरेंस टू द आउटपुट बिकॉज़ the uh, the output that you were getting through the pure one signal input uh, is 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 same as the uh, output that you you are going to get through that input multiplied by any number like 2 or 3 or 4 so jo output aapki one pe aa rahi hai wo output aapki 2 3 4 par bhi aayegi because your threshold is basically zero okay so if it is greater than zero you fire if it is less than equal to zero you do not fire so that is your that is your threshold right so if you multiply by any constant it's going to be the same but still you should you guys should try to you know do it on paper try to see chota sa ek toy experiment kar le this is uh, uh this is a more complicated example you can do just two neurons in each layer and then just try to do it so it is not going to make any difference because multiplying by a constant is not going to affect the decision function that is the basic idea okay um this other one suppose a network of perceptrons and that the overall input has been chosen and fixed suppose that the weights and biases are such that wx plus b is not equal to 0 for any perceptron for any neuron okay so then that means k wx plus b is not equal to 0 so not equal to 0 what does that mean either greater than 0 or less than 0 right yes agar greater than 0 hoga to kya hoga it is going to fire right yes sir or it is less than 0 not going to fire but it is, it is not zero okay now replace all the perceptrons in the network by sigmoid neurons Okay, so what is the by the sigmoid neurons and W X plus B is not equal to zero. So e to the power minus of something which is not zero. What is that? E to the power minus of something which is not zero. What is e to the power minus of zero? It is one. Oh. Or, huh? Oh, yes, sir. One will come. So it's never going to be one because the in it is doubt it is not going to be zero. it is either going to be more than 0 or less than 0 sir basically 1 upon 1 plus e raised to power minus z jo hai na 1 uh, plus 1 upon 1 plus 1 ho jayega agar 0 hota hai let's say so that means 1 upon 2 that means 0.5 to iska matlab hai jo bhi output hoga that should be either greater than 0.5 or less than 0.5 ah, yes, exactly yes. 0.5 nahi ho sakta exactly 0.5 nahi ho sakta and multiply the weights and biases by constant c acha by constant c so that is that should not make any difference right or should it be because we are not talking about perceptrons here we are talking about sigmoid neurons so if i say e to the power minus x or e to the power minus cx does that make a difference uh sir it would uh, thoda usko jo hai na sigmoid function pe i think thoda sa slightly extremes pe leke chala jayega मतलब जितना भी वैल्यू अगर पॉइंट 
then i keep on multiplying the weights and biases by larger and larger numbers so what does that mean wx plus b uh wx plus b is not equal to 0 so i multiply wx plus b uh by larger and larger weights so obviously it is going to it is going to grow very very far away from zero like 1000s may 2000 5000 so what is e to the power minus 5000 Or it to the power minus fifty thousand for that matter. Let me try it out. Zero. So it's uh, almost zero. Almost zero. one plus almost zero. One ah, upon one. That so it will approach one. If it is almost one. zero, so that means that the overall activation W X plus B is very very large, right? Like maybe fifty thousand. But when I take it to the logistics, uh, to the logistic function or the sigma function, then it just squashes to one. which is what happens yes. in the perceptron as well because if you have large input then the perceptron fires so in this case also that it remains the same i have 1 over 1 plus e to the power minus z minus z maine kaha ki is minus 50000 because of the fact that c is going to infinity minus 50000 e e to the power minus 50000 is almost zero so that is 1 over 1 that is 1 so that means that the neuron is firing as is the case of mm. perceptron So yes, the thing clear. Yes, sir. The same uh, question can come Gee, in the sir. exams as well. So please be careful. Also, how can this fail when W X plus B equals to zero? Sir, the output point five will come. How will point five come? Sir, sir, see, na one over one plus G uh, ki power minus zero. So it goes. It goes. One goes. Okay. So one over one plus one. So one over two goes. तो इनपुट ले and uh, it's always going to be between 0 and 1 on the gray scale mode where 0 means white and 1 means black theek okay? hai and uh, output will be a particular digit because we want to recognize digits right now if the threshold greater than 0.5 and uh, if the threshold is not greater than 0.5 then, then it is not that digit iske bare mein bhi mazid agli slide mein baat karte hain why it is called a feed forward neural network because we can only pass the data to the next layer we cannot skip layers there are no loops uh, meaning ki i cannot feed back to the previous layer unless i am doing back propagation which is the error back propagation not the data back propagation okay so no input can depend on any output from the next layer so i i cannot feed uh, data from the next layer to the previous layer no i can only feed the error to back propagation so i can only feed the data from the, i can keep on uh, passing the data from one layer to the other 1 to 2 2 to 3 2 to 3 to 4 4 to 5 5 to 6 unless uh, until i reach the output there that is the only way the neural networks work okay uh, in the case uh, in the case of recurrent neural networks it is possible to have loops that means feedback okay but uh, for example i can feed back from future to the present and from present to the past Uh, but this is not instantaneous so it is it does not have any negative impact rather it helps to uh, you know predict the sequence in a very good way uh, so this is this is sort of an exception but typically all of the neural networks we are dealing with are feed forward so and this is the only way to ensure that you keep on learning incrementally that but that's what we have been discussing since the start of the lecture okay so in the case of handwritten recognition what is going to happen so the best thing to do 
is to segment the image, right? So I can divide this image into six different parts and I can ask the neural network to recognize each one of them separately. Okay, and then I can combine the outputs in some way. Okay, so uh, if it is a 28 into 28 uh, image of each, uh, you know, I basically I train the neural network to recognize a five, a zero, four, one, nine, two. And I know now, okay, if I have to do that, then I have to provide it thousands to hundred thousands of examples of five, of zero, of four, of one, or nine and two. And then it is going to recognize. So I, I design a neural network which is able to recognize all the nine di uh, 10 digits from zero to nine, all the 10 digits from zero to nine. So I design a neural network, which is able to do that. Uh, and you can see this is a fully connected network, which is pretty uh, complicated. So I have 784 neurons. We're going to do the hands-on of this later on. I have 784 neurons because of the fact that the image quality is 28 by 28. This is probably the MNIST data set, which is very famous. We have no idea of the number of neurons in the hidden layer. Currently, we have 15, but we definitely need to experiment. We have no idea what is the ideal one. And there is one thing that you should keep in mind. How many digits we want to recognize? Ten. Six. No, no, I want to recognize zero to nine. How many digits are there? Ten digits. Ten digits. Ten digits. So I am recognizing one digit per neuron here. Why can't I have a binary scenario? Sir, like example, I say okay, zero, 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 zero represents a zero. I just want to use, why, can't, why don't I use four binary neurons? Sir, uh, neural network to have a probabilistic output data that we have a probability of So the probability of our own and then we can use it accordingly. नहीं तो probability तो इसकी भी आ सकती है zero 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 की probability आ सकती है that represents a zero finish this is, Sir, this is more than an either or or uh, problem isn't it there are so many uh, variables that we have to consider नहीं नहीं that's not the solution please uh, uh, और थोड़ा सोचें sir I think होने में तो हो सकता है if वे जो क्लासिकल स्टाइल है वो तो आप वही है जो आप दिखा रहे हैं इनिशियली के भी 0 1 2 3 4 आप क्लासिफिकेशन के तौर पे इस्तेमाल कर रहे होते हैं लेकिन सर आई थिंक इट्स पॉसिबल कि आप 0 1s में भी इसको आउटपुट कर सकते हैं लेकिन हां 0 1s में भी आउटपुट कर सकते हैं 0 1s बाइनरी में भी आउटपुट आ सकता है बस वो ट्रेन डिफरेंटली करेगा वो इस तरह करेगा कि नहीं नहीं ट्रेन डिफरेंटली करेगा वो ट्रेन इतना एफिशिएंटली नहीं करेगा देखिए उसकी वजह ये है इफ आई यूज द ओनली फोर न्यूरॉन्स एट द आउटपुट लेयर I can use that neural network to train to recognize 10 digits. I can, but its accuracy is not going to be that much because if I dedicate one separate neuron for each particular digit, if I dedicate one separate neuron for each particular digit, in that case, what happens is the neural network is basically, according to my hypothesis, learning the shapes of the numbers, right? So, <clears throat> if it has to recognize zero, it starts by recognizing this, for example, uh, in this particular neuron. Then it's it recognizes this part, let's say, in, in these three neurons, which are here. Then it recognizes this, for example, in these five neurons, which are here, let's say, whatever. Then this one it recognizing in, in these three neurons. And then finally, it is able to make a complete picture in these final three neurons. This is just, let's say we have an hypothesis. We are allowing the neural network the flexibility <coughs> to learn based on the curvature or the shape of the digit. That's the only way to learn, right? So I, I assume that whatever is coming out of this hidden layer is dealing with shapes, okay? So it makes sense for me to associate this whole shape of this whole neuron, of this whole vector of neurons output with one particular neuron, which is relevant to that particular shape. If I put it in 0, 0, 0, 0, then it is going to become very difficult for me to associate a shape with four numbers. In that case, I will be worried not about learning a zero, but learning 0, 0, 0, 0, which is just a binary output. Do you understand? In that case, I will, be, I will start to focus on 
बिट वाइज ऑपरेशन एंड नॉट ऑन जीरो यहां पे मैंने क्या किया है कि मैंने हर न्यूरॉन की शेप मैंने अलग कर दी हर न्यूरॉन को मैंने अलग every neuron i dedicated that to a separate number so that the shape of that particular neuron uh, of that particular number can be associated only with that particular output neuron in this way the association will become easy do you understand ye samajh mein aa rahi baat ki aapko जी सर थोड़ी थोड़ी सर प्लीज रिपीट कर दीजिए आई मैं होल जीरो समझ में आ गई बात की जी सर so it is going to learn parts of the zeros in different parts of the network that is what it is going to do so therefore i assume that is exactly what is happening at the input layer uh, at the hidden layer in the hidden layer the neural network is learning parts of zeros parts of ones parts of 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 theek hai वो उसको टुकड़ों में सीख रहा है हर नंबर के जो टुकड़े हैं पार्ट्स हैं वो उनको सीख रहा है इट्स लर्निंग दोज सही है क्लियर है सर तो आई एम सेइंग इज के आई डू नॉट वांट टू पुट फोर आउटपुट न्यूरॉन्स हेयर बिकॉज इन दैट केस द शेप विच द शेप पैटर्न्स विच आर लर्न इन द हिडन लेयर दे आर गेटिंग मैप to some bitwise number like 0000000010 and not to the value 0 which is what i want exactly i don't want sir? to map to 000 because dekhen logically bhi wo mapping nahi banti na zehen mein bhai jab ek number 0 hai to aap zero output karwa lo bhai aapko 0000 ko beech mein lane ki kya zarurat hai aap zero output alag se karwa lo sahi hai clear ho gayi baat सर अगर हम आउटपुट लेयर के बाद एक और लेयर लगाते हैं जिसके जिसमें खाली चार वो न्यूरॉन्स हो आपके और कम वेट्स उस हिसाब से एडजस्ट कर लें के जीरो पे जो है वो मतलब उस हिसाब से व्हाई वुड वी नीड दैट व्हेन वी हैव एन आउटपुट लेयर व्हिच इज रिकॉग्नाइजिंग ईच डिजिट इन अ वेरी वेरी गुड वे सर मतलब अगर आपको बाइनरी में अगर आपको बाइनरी में आउटपुट चाहिए उसके लिए मैं कह रहा हूं हां देन देखें इन दैट केस यू डोंट नीड टू हैव दिस 10 लेयर यू डोंट नीड टू हैव यू जस्ट यू जस्ट रिप्लेस इट बाय फोर फोर न्यूरॉन्स एंड इट इज गोइंग टू इट इज गोइंग टू रिकॉग्नाइज इट इज गोइंग टू से फॉर एग्जांपल के 0000 इक्वल्स टू 0 0001 इक्वल्स टू नंबर 1 सॉरी फॉर दैट ये है ठीक है 00 उटफुलटली okay sahi so, sir ha uh, that's the main thing that you need to keep in mind so we want the net, uh, hidden layer to be associated oh sorry with shapes rather than the bits that's the whole answer we want to associate the output layer with the shape not with the bits therefore we don't use those okay find a set of weights and biases for the new output layer where the new output layer ha ye okay so we'll do this in the next class inshallah taala so the next class is going to be on sunday hopefully uh, from 9:30 to 10:45
and we are going to have a similar session during the week as well. Uh, but I will start uh, early. Maybe I will start at nine o'clock. On Sunday also, let's start at nine o'clock. Is nine o'clock fine for everybody? So, Raat ke? Huh? Raat ke? No, but the subah ke? Ah, ah, Raat ke, yar. Sahiye sir. लेक्चर जी सर भाई अभी तो अभी तो बहुत बेसिक स्टार्ट हुआ है वी नीड टू कीप द एक्सरसाइज और अभी मैं ऑन ऑन साइड ही आना पड़ेगा ठीक है बहरहाल चले लेट्स सी ओके ओके सर अल्लाह हाफिज़